What is Christianity? Part 5. The Status of Gospel of John. An objection may arise, namely that the doctrine of incarnation appears in the beginning of the Gospel of John as follows. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 1 colon 1. It states further. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. These are the words attributed to John. Because John was a disciple, it appears that the founder of the doctrine of incarnation was not Paul, but John. This objection would have been sound if the Gospel of John were at least as authoritative as the first three. Gospels. This Gospel however is coincidentally a Gospel whose authenticity is doubted by the Christians themselves. A large group among the Christians of the second century have denied that the Gospel was written by John. In recent times, the authenticity of this Gospel became the center of debate and friction. Numerous books were written analyzing its authenticity, and thousands of pages of discussion were written. It is not possible for us to summarize these discussions, but we shall refer to some salient points. Irenaeus, Origen, Clement and Eusebius were the first to claim that this gospel was the work of John, the disciple. However, at that time, 254 AD, a group of Christians refused to accept that John wrote the gospel. Encyclopedia Britannica explains the position of this group as follows. A positive testimony for the critical conclusion is derived from the existence of a group of Asia Minor Christians who about 165 rejected the Gospel as not by John but by Cerinthus. The attribution is doubtless mistaken. But could Christians who were sufficiently numerous to deserve a long discussion by St. Epiphanius in 374 to 377, and who upheld the Synoptists, Stouts opposed the Gnostics and Montanists, and had escaped every special designation till the bishop nicknamed them the Elogi, irrational ejectors of the Logos, Gospel, Dare, in such a time and country, to hold such views. Had the apostolic origin been incontestable? Then there is internal evidence which shows that this Gospel was not written by the disciple John. For example, the author of this book was certainly a Jewish theologian who was familiar with Jewish thought and ideas. As appears from the Acts, 4.13, the Apostle John, son of Zebedee was uneducated. Furthermore, the Gospel reveals that its author was deeply learned and belonged to a noble family. Whereas John, the son of Zebedee had a lower status from a worldly viewpoint. Apart from this, the fourth Gospel differs radically in content and style from the first three Gospels. The first person to ascribe the Gospel as the work of John was Irenaeus who, according to Christian scholars, could not be relied on as authentic in the field of critical analysis. For similar reasons, a large group of Christian scholars in recent times are of the view t had the Gospel of John a fabrication and should not be included amongst revealed books. But, those Christian scholars, who regard the Gospel as correct and who wish to save it from the slander of fabrication, are virtually unanimous in our time that the author thereof was not John the son of Zebedee but John the Elder. James Mackinon writes. Mackinon, p. 119. It is likely enough that Irenaeus, whose accuracy and critical discernment are not outstanding has confused him with another John John T. He Elder mentioned by Papias of Hierapolis in Asia. In the second quarter of the second century, as well as with the prophet John of the Book of Revelation. Barakatullah the well-known Christian writer of Pakistan writes. Barakatullah, Vol. 2, p. 140. We have reached the conclusion that the narration that the Gospel of John was written by John the son of Zebedee is incorrect. He writes further. The truth is that the theologians are not willing to accept without debate that the fourth gospel was written by John the son of Zebedee. And generally, theories to the contrary are seen. He has in his book endeavored in great detail to substantiate his claim that the author of the fourth gospel was not John the son of Zebedee. Why did he see the need to establish this claim? He provides an answer in the following words. Those theologians who believe that the fourth gospel was written by John son of Zebedee they do not generally accept the historical significance of this gospel. Their theory is that the fourth gospel is free of historical events, and that its contents belong to the author who puts it in the mouth of the word of God. In view of the fact that the attribution of the fourth gospel as the work of John the son of Zebedee, the disciple, places its authenticity in serious doubt. The reverend has attempted to show that it was written by John the Elder. His research is that John the Elder was also a pupil of Jesus, but that he was not counted among the twelve disciples. Jesus had honored him by including him in his company in his last days. John the Elder was a young person, cultured and learned in the Old Testament, and belonged to a noble family. He has expressed this in his Gospel. 
This conclusion is widely accepted in the Christian world today. On this basis they have rejected John the son of Zebedee, the disciple, as the author of the fourth gospel. In our view, this conclusion is without foundation. Apart from protecting the originality of the Gospel of John, we cannot see any other reason for it. The question arises that if John the Elder, apart from the Twelve, was also another pupil of Jesus, why has he not mentioned in the first three Gospels? The fourth Gospel indicated that its author was not only in close contact with Jesus but also that Jesus loved him deeply. The author of the fourth Gospel has in many places instead of using his name, has used the expression, the disciple whom Jesus loved. At the end, he says that the meaning of that expression is the author of the fourth Gospel himself. The ease with which he dealt with Jesus is expressed by him in the following words. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was lying close to the breast of Jesus. 13.23 He says further. So lying thus, close to the breast of Jesus, he said to him, Lord, who is it? 13.25 None amongst the twelve disciples dared to eat whilst lying on the breast of Jesus, it must be noted that, apart from the fourth gospel. The other Gospels do not mention the particular manner of eating and questioning of this disciple. But this disciple was so loved that he did not see anything wrong in so eating. If Jesus was so close to him, then the first question is why did Jesus not include him amongst his disciples? Is it rationally acceptable that Judas Iscariot who was regarded a thief, John 12 6, and who betrayed Jesus and caused him to be arrested, Luke 22. 3. Be included amongst the twelve, and that pupil of Jesus, who ate by lying on his breast and who was most concerned at his ascension to heaven by reason of separation from him, should not be included amongst the disciples. Secondly, why is it that the first three Gospels, which according to Christians can tear a complete description and detail of his life, even mentioning ordinary parsons who were connected to him such as Mary Magdalene, Martha to the extent that there is mention of his donkey, completely fail to make any reference to this beloved pupil of Jesus? Then, if there were a disciple by name of John the Elder, apart from John the disciple, surely there was a need for authors of the four Gospels to explain the distinction to avoid confusion. We note that amongst the disciples of Jesus, there were two persons with the name James James son of Zebedee, and James the son of Alphaeus. Similarly, there were two persons with the name of Judas, Judas son of James, and Judas Iscariot. To distinguish between them, the authors of the Gospels have taken care to mention them separately, so that nobody may be confused. See Matt 10 colon 6, Mark 3 16, Luke 6 14, Acts 1 13. If there were two persons by the name of John amongst the disciples of Jesus, then why did the authors of the Gospels not dispel the confusion as in the case of James and Judas? Apart from this, if there were a beloved disciple of Jesus by name of John the Elder, then where did he go after the ascension of Jesus? The efforts and struggles of the disciples after Jesus in the propagation and teachings of Christianity are described in detail in the book Acts. Wherein the struggles of his outstanding disciples are recorded. But, there is no reference in that book to a person known as John the Elder. It cannot also be said that he died immediately after the ascension of Jesus. Because the Gospel of John was written very much after the time of Jesus. It is stated therein that, and this is famous amongst the disciples, the author of the fourth gospel will live till the day of judgment. 21-23, hence, all Christian theologians, who regard John the Elder as separate from the John the son of Zebedee, are of the view that John the Elder remained alive for a considerable period after Jesus to the extent that Polycarp became his pupil. The evidence is therefore indisputable that John the Elder was not a disciple of Jesus. There remains the verse at the end of the Gospel of John, namely, this is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things, and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. 2124. The majority of Christian scholars are of the view that this verse is not that of the author of the Gospel of John, but that is an addition of later times. The well-known commentator of the Bible Westcott who is very cautious and careful in the criticism of the Bible, says in this regard. Quoted by Streeter, p. 430. These two verses appear to be separate notes attached to the Gospel before its publication. The form of verse 24 contrasted with that of 1935 shows conclusively that it is not the witness of the evangelist. The words were probably added by the Apician elders, to whom the preceding narrative had been given both orally and in writing. This view is supported by the well-known writer of modern times Bishop Gore, and this is the reason why these two verses are not found in the Codex Sinaiticus. Hence, one cannot say that the writer of these verses was a disciple of Jesus.
It follows from the foregoing as established beyond doubt that the author of the fourth gospel is neither John son of Zebedee the disciple, nor any other disciple of Jesus. Our view is that the author of this gospel was a person who lived very much later than the disciples, and who acquired his learning under Paul or his pupils. According to Westcott, in order to ascribe the gospel to John, son of Zebedee, certain sentences were added which indicate the personal experience of the writer. With a view to refuting the arguments of some Gnostic sects of those times who rejected the divinity of Jesus. It is undisputed in the academic world that alternations in holy books were common and continued in order to debate with opposing sects of the time. Professor Streeter, the well-known Christian scholar of our times writes in his excellent work, The Four Gospels, in the most clear terms as follows, p.4. If then, in the fourth gospel we find an addition to the text, admittedly not by the original author, which makes a definite statement as to authorship. Is it not more probable that it was made at some later date, perhaps also in some other locality? And was intended to assert a view as to the authorship of the book from which certain person at that time or place dissented. And that such dissent did exist in the second century we shall see shortly. That being so, the addition of the words, this is the disciple which wrote these things, is to be interpreted as an attempt to settle a debated question, and is, therefore, additional evidence of the existence of doubts in regard to the authorship of the gospel. Hence, it is not without wonder, in such a situation that the fourth gospel and the letters of John were written by a pupil of Paul, and people in later times made certain alterations which indicate that the author himself personally met Jesus. In the light of the general approach of those times, this conclusion appears to be correct. However, adopting a purely Christian view, the most that could be said is that the fourth gospel was written by John the Elder, but he was, instead of being a disciple of Jesus, a disciple of his disciples, and if one adopted the view of extreme optimism, then the view of Professor Streeter could be adopted that the author of the fourth gospel was John the Elder, but that Streeter, p. 443 John the Elder is described by Papias as a disciple of the Lord, by Polycarp as one who had seen the Lord. We need not suppose that he had done much more than see him, brought perhaps as a boy of twelve years old to Jerusalem by his father on pilgrimage to the Passover. And he may have been among the crowd that looked on at the crucifixion, people in those days were not careful to keep such sights from children. In that case by AD 95 he would have reached the age of 77. The first epistle of John was obviously written by a man of advanced years, who can pass quite naturally from brethren to my little children, in the same paragraph, IJN 3 13 and 18. This last phase would hardly have been written by a man under 70. There is, then, no difficulty on this score in supposing that John the Elder wrote the Gospel AD 9095 at the age of 70 or more. Conclusions It is the purely extreme Christian view that attempts to save the fourth Gospel from being declared as created. If we free ourselves from the attempts at justification, and accept the theory as it is, we arrive at the following conclusions. 1. The author of the fourth gospel was not John the son of Zebedee, the disciple but John the Elder. 2. John the Elder is not amongst the disciples of Jesus. 3. John the Elder saw Jesus once at the age of twelve, but did not get the opportunity of serving him or hearing his teachings. 4. John the Elder saw Jesus in the last stage of crucifixion. 5. He was not a citizen of Jerusalem, but he was a resident of the southern regions of Canaan. 6. After Jesus and until 95 AD, we have no knowledge of him as to where he lived. And from whom he acquired knowledge. Whose company he frequented. And what relationships he had with the disciples. 7. On or about 95 AD, at the age of about 70, he wrote the Gospel of John in which he mentions for the first time the doctrine of incarnation. 8. Later an addition was made at the end of the Gospel which indicated that its author was the disciple John the son of Zebedee or some beloved disciple of Jesus. The above conclusions are not the result of our reasoning, but were arrived at by Christian theologians in order to save the Gospel from being declared as created. In the light of these conclusions, we arrive at the following undisputed facts. a. The doctrine of incarnation cannot be ascribed to Jesus or any of his disciples. B. This doctrine was the first written in the life of Jesus by a person who at the age of twelve only saw Jesus but did not acquire learning from him. C. The person who presents this doctrine is unknown, that is, apart from his writing, his condition and situation is unknown, what type of person was he? What were his beliefs? Did he coin this doctrine himself? Or did he hear it from somebody else? Where did he pass his life? What was his relationship with the disciples?
D. This doctrine was inserted in the Bible around 95 AD when his age was 70 and 28 years had passed since the death of Paul. E. Because Paul had died before him, and Paul had clearly expounded the doctrine of incarnation in his letters. It follows therefore that the first person to expound the doctrine was not John the Elder but Paul. The Doctrine of Redemption The foregoing discussion proves clearly that the doctrine of incarnation is neither supported by any statement of Jesus nor was it espoused by any disciple Paul was the first person to present the Doctrine Now, let us see who is the founder of the second doctrine of Christianity, namely, Redemption. And from where did it originate? This doctrine according to Daniel Wilson 55 is the spirit of Christianity. You have read in the first chapter that salvation on the one hand is dependent on this doctrine. Baptism and the Last Supper are also based on it. On the other hand, the philosophy which underlies this doctrine is highly intricate and delicate. Hence, one would think that the four Gospels would contain many statements of Jesus explaining the doctrine. And Jesus and his disciples would have clearly expounded it. Such thinking is correct because the cardinal beliefs and doctrines of any religion are death within detail in the basic books and the writings of the founders of that religion. And the basic books of the religion wholly attempt to establish such doctrines. For example, the basic doctrines of Islam are the unity of God, the finality of the prophethood of Muhammad and belief in the hereafter. Hence, the Quran is filled with explanation of these doctrines and their proofs. But, the position of Christianity is the opposite. Those theories which are fundamental to Christianity and which distinguish it from other religions are absent from the Gospels. There is no explanation for them from Jesus or any of his disciples. You have already noted the position of the doctrines of Trinity and Incarnation. The same applies to the doctrine of redemption which is not proved by any statement of Jesus. In order to appreciate this, let us cast a glance on those verses of the Gospel which Christians consider as supporting the doctrine, and from which the doctrine is derived. These verses are as follows. 1. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins, Matt, 121. 2. And the angel said. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Who is Christ the Lord? Luke 2, 10. 3. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, Luke 2, 30. 4. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19, 10. 5. Even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, Matt 20, 28, Mark 10, 48. 6. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matt 26, 28. Apart from the above verses, there is nothing in the Gospels relating to the doctrine of redemption. The difficulty is that after reading these verses the mind immediately directs itself to this doctrine because of its popularity and widespread publication. However, from the viewpoint of impartial research, if one divests the mind for a short while of all the details of the doctrine as set out in the first part of this work, and then reads the verses once, the plain meaning is that Jesus came to provide guidance and salvation to those steeped in the darkness of misguidance, and to show the straight path of guidance to those who became entitled to perpetual punishment by reason of denying God, polytheism, and bad deeds, and thereby saving them from the punishment of hell. Irrespective of the difficulties and hardships he had to face in his propagational activities and services, and to give his life as a ransom for many, and this is my blood of the covenant which is poured for many for the forgiveness of sins. If the conception of the doctrine of redemption has not settled in the mind from the beginning, then the clear meaning of these verses is that Jesus is willing. In order to save people from misguidance and to give them the means of causing their previous sins to be forgiven, to even sacrifice his life. And he indicates this in these verses. These verses do not support the philosophy that the free will of man was removed by reason of the sin of Adam, and that consequently the original sin became embedded in Adam and his children. And that therefore every innocent child became entitled to perpetual punishment. Then the person of God in the form of the Son assumed upon himself the sins of the world by means of the with the result that the original sin of all was forgiven. If the purpose of the above verses was to explain the doctrine of redemption, then why did Jesus not explain it in detail especially when it constituted a cardinal article of faith? Belief wherein was essential for salvation. One hears day and night expressions such as a certain person has sacrificed his life in order to save his nation, such expressions are used in relation to prophets and leaders of nations. Nobody, however, can't use such expressions to the effect that the sin of Adam has been imposed on the nation. On the contrary, the leader has himself tolerated the punishment inflicted on him. 
Then, if there is room to construe such verses in the manner alleged, then one is fired to infer also that Jesus assumed upon himself all the sins of his community. Hence, punishment would not be given notwithstanding the sins committed until the day of judgment. Whereas, this is refuted from the beginning by all the churches. For this reason, those Christian theologians who read these verses impartially have instead of inferring the complex philosophy of redemption, understood the word in their ordinary sense as explained by us above. In the beginning of Christian history, this was the view of Seals to use. Then the sect known as Socinians also interpreted the verses in this manner. The Encyclopedia Britannica states in this regard. Those people found in Christ's life are only a sublime example of the way to salvation. Abelard was of the view that the meaning of redemption was simply that the life and death of Jesus was a complete lesson in mercy and compassion. In fact, the above verses clearly do not prove the meaning of the doctrine of redemption as contended for today. The meaning of those verses relied upon is something else. Now, reverting to disciples, we cannot find even one sentence of theirs which support the doctrine of redemption. Hence, the first person who expo uses this doctrine was Paul who expounded it philosophically in his letter to the Romans. Therefore as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sin sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one who has to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For it many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of that one man Jesus Christ abounded for many, and the free gift is not like the effect of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ, than as one man's trespass led to F.S. Condemnation for all men, one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. Ram 5.12 He explains further. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Hence we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Rom 6 3 This is the very same theory of redemption which we have set out in the first chapter in detail. This doctrine has not been espoused by any person prior to Paul. Hence, he is the founder of the doctrine. The order to act on the Torah. After discussing the basic doctrines of Christianity, it is desirable that we determine by research the teaching of Jesus in regard to specific matters or orders. And what changes were effected by Paul. Jesus has clearly stated on a number of occasions that his purpose was not to oppose the Torah, but to confirm it. To the extent that it is stated in the Gospels that Jesus did not come to abrogate it. It is reported by Matthew. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, I have come not to abolish Tehem but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Matt 5.17 Moreover, on one occasion he stated, So whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matt 7.12 It follows that Jesus fundamentally regarded the Torah as worthy of respect and action thereon. But, what is the theory of Paul on the rulings of the Torah? This appears from his statements in his letter to the Galatians, as follows. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Gal 3.13 He says further. Now before faith came, we were confined under the law, kept under restraint until faith should be revealed. So that the law was our custodian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a custodian. Gal 3.23 In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul states, By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances, thereby bringing the hostility to an end. F2.15 In the letter to the Hebrews he says, For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Hebrews 7 12-13 Further he says, 
For if that first covenant, Torah, had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. Dot, Heb. 8 colon 7. In speaking of a new covenant, he treats the first as obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. 8.13. In the light of the aforegoing statements, Paul has totally ended the practical relevance and importance of the Torah, and has abrogated all its orders and rulings. Last Supper. The details of this ritual were set out in the previous chapter. This form of worship ranks amongst the most important rituals of Christianity. But there is no reference in Mark and Matthew to an order by Jesus directing that this act be made a perpetual ritual. Paul was the first to render it a ritual, ICOR 11.24, and Luke followed suit because he was a student of Paul. Christian theologians have conceded this. Hence F.C. Burkett says. It must be noted that the word law in the Bible refers to the Torah. The account of the Last Supper in Mark does not indicate that this act must be celebrated in the future. But St. Paul when referring to the act attributes it to Jesus and adds the following sentence, Do this in remembrance of me. The Order or Circumcision The order of circumcision has come down from the time of Abraham. Torah says, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep, between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, so shall my covenant be in you flesh an everlasting covenant. An uncircumcised male who is not circumcised eye on the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people, he has broken my covenant. General 17 9-14 And addressing Moses. And on the eighth day of the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Leviticus 12 3 Jesus himself was circumcised, as stated in Luke 2 21. Thereafter there is no statement of Jesus to the effect that the order circumcision has been abrogated. In this regard, the theory of Paul appears from his letters. In his letter to the Galatians, he says, Now I, Paul say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. Galen 5 2 He says further, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Gal 6 15 